Okay, so um, I appreciate it's a large topic, so this episode is likely to be like an hour long or something like that. And I would encourage everyone to actually listen to the whole thing because it's taken an hour to cover uh, it in a way that it all makes sense and provide you with guidance as well. But at the same time, I appreciate that some people just want the answer as quickly and as soon as possible. For those people, uh, here are the next couple of minutes or so in which I'm going to try and cover the content of this video and provide you with the self-help self guide that you're looking for. So you're going to start off with reading the Wikipedia article on Hinduism. You're going to read the whole thing and understand it as much as possible. Then you're going to move on to the next Wikipedia article, which is Mahabharat. Again, you're going to read, understand as much as possible. Then you're going to uh, move on to the third Wikipedia article, which is Ramayana. Once you've done that, you're going to go online and you're going to find a summarized copy of the Mahabharat. Okay, maybe you'll have to download it from somewhere, maybe you can buy it from somewhere, but you are going to buy a summarized copy uh, or get or obtain a co copy uh, summarized of Mahabharat. Read that, understand that, as well as Ramayana. Okay, um, treat it as the longest summary as you can tolerate. If you can only tolerate a summary which is five pages, then read the five pages. If you can tolerate a 50-page summary, then read a 50-page summary. The longest summarized form you can of the Mahabharat and the Ramayana. Um, after you've done that, you're going to read another Wikipedia article, which is the Bhagavad Gita. You're going to read through that, fully understand everything that it says, and then you are going to access the Bhagavad Gita online and read through all the different uh, various sections of it. And for that, you're going to go to this website. It's called Bhagavad dash gita dot org okay right here so i'll go to the main page and you can see the different chapters that you're going to go into and you're going to start reading them one after the other and you will see a section like this for a specific uh, sort of uh, uh, verse and you can see the various different translations and on the right hand side you can see the recordings in different languages as well so at this point you've read the book with gita after that you're going to go to another wikipedia article which is advaita vedanta you're going to read through this whole article, understand everything and the different concepts. And after you've done that, you're going to read another Wikipedia article, which is Yoga Vashishta. Once you've read the Wikipedia article on Yoga Vashishta, and you've done the Advaita Vedanta, you're going to access a second book, uh, and which is the Yoga Vashishta Maharamayan. You're going to access that book from this website right here. You can see it here in EPUB formats, etc. But I'm also going to give you a share to the Google Drive, which will have all the relevant readings and the website material anyway. Uh, the link to this will be in the description as well as in the comment section. This is one of the most important books I think anyone can read. So once you've read that, well done, congratulations. Then you're going to read another article, Ashtavakra Gita. Okay, you're going to read this. Once you've read this, you're going to read the book itself to get the book. There's this website called Sanskrit Documents, but again, like I've mentioned, you will find it in the Google Drive anyway, but this is uh, this is where the book is. And uh, here is a sample, okay, it's translated by John Richards, and you're going to read this. Once you've read that, you've pretty much done all the reading that you need to do, in my opinion, as a beginner for a self-help guide. Now, throughout this whole period when you do this reading, you should be applying it uh, in your life, in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and it can be uh, sort of in line with your scientific approaches as well. It doesn't need to replace anything, if you like. It needs to work in harmony with how your life already works. Um, and that's the approach you're going to take. So that is a very, very quick, as quick as I can make it, summary of all the reading material that you'll have to do uh, in order to um, understand Hinduism at a basic to intermediate level. Okay? For other people who prefer the long form, continue to listen on, and I'm sure it'll be worth it. Hey guys, thank you very much for tuning in to another episode of My Life Speaks, the place for random talks on random thoughts. Today, my aim is to provide you with a self-help guide to Hinduism. Now, before starting, I would like to say that however you've come across this episode, you are welcome here, most certainly. No matter what your religious, cultural, ethnic background, linguistic background, whether you are a believer, whether you're an atheist or an agnostic or anything else, you are most certainly welcome here. Uh, whether you find yourself in search for answers or just out of sheer curiosity, you are definitely welcome here, okay? There's only positive vibes on this channel, only peace and love. Now, I would also like to say uh, that this episode is likely to be a long one, as if my others aren't, <laughs> but uh, you should definitely listen to it in parts, okay, and with patience. Um, you will definitely get the self-help guide, which I'm alluding to in the title to this episode, 
but I also hope that everything else I say prior to providing that guide also helps you in some way. Now in this episode, I'll be sharing my experience, opinions, my perspectives as well, and I'm very aware that there is no right or wrong answer as far as I'm concerned anyway, and I hope that you can respect my views the way I would respect yours. But at the same time, it is very unlikely that there is anything in this content uh, which anyone should have problems with. Uh, there's definitely no intention such as those in this episode is only there to provide guidance, and it comes from a uh, sort of peace and love sort of place, okay? I would also suggest to, to all the listeners to try and avoid labeling me, the speaker or the maker of this video, insofar as any religiousness is concerned. I am perfectly happy with being religious on some days, agnostic on other days, spiritual on other days, and even atheists on some other days. And I'm sure many people find themselves in the similar kind of place from time to time. And I should also add that all of this is compatible within the scope of Hinduism, okay? Uh, for those who aren't Hindus, and for some who are, you may find that surprising, but you heard that absolutely right. You can even be an atheist Hindu, for example. And um, I should also mention that people can get very sensitive about topics such as religion, politics, their sports teams even, and that is completely understandable. And if you find any part of this episode disagreeable, please feel free to ignore the video and the episode in its entirety. Uh, there's no such negative intent uh, at all in the making of this video. I've only made this episode to help anyone else seeking such content. So I assure you that uh, it's coming from a very good and wholesome place. Anyway, so let's first talk a little bit about um, how the idea for this episode came about. Uh, so I'm a regular gym goer, uh, some people might know that already, and uh, there's one day this Indian Hindu girl started to talk to me and she was going through a breakup after a long relationship and she was telling me stuff about she was going through and uh, the difficult times and what she was trying to do to help her life sort of get back on track and quote-unquote uh, find herself, uh, which included trying to get back to her religious roots and like I said she's a Hindu herself. Uh, she also mentioned that she would like to start to get into reading the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the major texts in Hinduism, uh, but hadn't made a start or a clear plan as to how she'd go about it. She'd never read the Bhagavad Gita. She she didn't grow up with those sorts of things uh, even. Um, so she needed some guidance, basically. So I gave her some initial guidance. And then over the coming months, we bumped into each other every now and then, and she told me about the success that she had. And that's basically the reason I was like, okay, if, if what I told her has helped her in some way on her journey, then maybe I can make an episode and I can help other people too uh, by, by making some content like this. Now, the reason I was able to provide um, the guidance to her fairly swiftly and succinctly is because I'd gone through some quite significant life event when I was younger myself. And over the following years after that event, uh, among many, many other things that I read, I mean, I used to just kind of spend hours and hours on Wikipedia every single day. But amongst all of those other things that I read, I also read widely around Hinduism and the scriptures and what have you to see if I could find some answers there, which I could discover, which I could then apply to my own life, which would hopefully help me in some way. Um, by the by, I mean, the Hindu scriptures are very sort of a very large number and they're called Shastra, in, in general, Shastra, okay? Um, that's kind of a catch-all wor uh, word for all of them, insofar as I'm aware, but there, there's technically there's different words for different scriptures and so forth. And speaking of Shastra as well, um, and how many sort of different versions there are, and different subjects that it covers, and, and how diverse it all is, I should also mention that Hinduism is also so mind-bogglingly vast that you may find yourself at wit's end trying to figure out where you would even begin your journey. Okay, So to help you visualize the vastness, just imagine a set of religious beliefs that are so vast and intricate that it has been able to give birth to two entire other religions. Okay, And that's on top of the separate hundreds if not thousands of sects which exist within Hinduism itself. All of those sects would like to consider themselves separate from, from one another but nevertheless, for the most part, they do coexist in harmony and would likely agree on quite a few things 
that they have in common, some core beliefs as well. So that's just a couple of words there to explain to you how vast of a subject uh, Hinduism actually is and how bewildering it can be for someone who hasn't grown up uh, with all those texts around them or discussions around them. And, and, and just it's, it's like, where do I even start with these things? when it's such a huge subject and that's partly the motivation behind making this video as well. So whilst we're on the subject of Hinduism as well, it is quite an ancient uh, religion, if you want to call it that. Um, I mean, Hinduism is the oldest surviving widely practiced religion that we have today on the planet. Um, Hindus themselves believe that the religion is quite comfortably around 10,000 years old from inception, perhaps even older. I mean, I personally re remember watching a documentary where they were singing shlokas, which are like hymns, um, sort of thing, incantations, that kind of thing. Uh, but these hymns, once these academics kind of examined them uh, closely, they uh, they were more just like bird songs, okay? Um, songs, bird songs which you'd hear in the forest and that sort of thing. So you can imagine how long ago these hymns must have been uh, made, um, uh, where you know humans were living in forests and maybe worship worshiping the forest uh, sort of spirits and things like that and modern civilization and farming probably wasn't even developed at that point so um, it's a very long time ago basically and I think it was estimated by those people in the documentaries um, that uh, these shlokas and, and the things they were singing were probably like 15,000 years old or something like that and it was in the southern part of India. Now I could be remembering a couple of bo those bits of information wrong but I'm, I'm very sure, 90% sure, that uh, I definitely saw that documentary from a reliable source as well and I think the people who were studying that were from Europe uh, so it wasn't like any intellectual bias or anything like that insofar as I can remember. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the Brahmins, um, so there's like a small community of Brahmins who kind of preserve these shlokas and these old stories and everything else and what have you. Um, they utter these um, shlokas and, and they sing, etc. And they've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years and they pass it from generation to generation. And they remember all the shlokas, so they remember all these old things from 10,000, maybe 15,000 years ago, and they also remember the shlokas from 500 years ago and 600 years ago. So when you study these, you can actually see the evolution, step-by-step uh, -step kind of a thing, as to how these things evolve over time. Uh, so that's also quite interesting, I think. And all of this has been passed down in oral tradition, so there's no, nothing written really uh, with a lot of these things. And again, these things have been studied. If you want to read about it a bit more, you can go on Wikipedia. You can read about the di various different techniques which are employed to make sure that these things are preserved over time and preserved perfectly. Uh, and some of these methodologies, I think, are World Heritage Sites and things like that as well, or, or the, the texts and things anyway. Uh, again, might be using the wrong terminology, but again, you can double check this and verify all this, all the various methods that they use. And what they found was that um, these oral traditions of remembering these shlokas uh, and stories, etc., is even more accurate than it being written down. Because when you write things down, there's potential for error uh, during these times. Remember, we're talking the last 10,000 years. Uh, doing transcription, maybe unforeseen circumstances like weather, maybe the leaves rotting away. All sorts of things can happen which mean uh, that uh, the text isn't preserved in the same way. Whereas what they found was when it is passed by oral tradition and these very specific precise techniques, which all have names by the way, so you can, you can, you can read into them, the things were preserved pretty much perfectly uh, with almost no errors whatsoever even spanning thousands of years. So it is a very accurate and sophisticated way to pass on information uh, whilst preserving its content. So there's a couple of bits of scintillating uh, information which I think you might find interesting on your journey about Hinduism and things like that, okay? But uh, before you start on the journey to understand Hinduism, it's also, I think, worth giving you some heads up on what you will find so that you are not completely surprised, okay? Now, someone like me, uh, I would be less surprised uh, as I read more and more about it in the past when I did, because I would consider myself to be a Hindu from birth and having grown up um, sort of discussing the various intricacies of philosophy for, um, well, as long as I can remember. Uh, that, that would, by the way, occur mainly with my father 
a little bit of input from my mum from now and then as well, but mainly from my dad. So basically growing up, I'd be very familiar with these core concepts of Hinduism. Um, other Hindus will find perhaps certain themes of uh, what they read to be familiar, but at the same time, many may also find things unfamiliar, like the thing I just said, that Hindus can be atheists as uh, while still being Hindus. And that, so to some people, may sound quite strange. But if they read into everything, they'll find that that's perfectly compatible with the Hindu philosophy and belief systems, okay? So again, that's just to give you heads up as, as you start on your journey to understand Hinduism. Don't be... You know, don't be too surprised that you'll find things which you which are quite different to what you may already assume to be the case. And that's okay. That's all part and parcel of the journey. So for those who are embarking on this journey and you are not a Hindu, uh, just a heads up for you as well, uh, that some of the things you find may feel quite strange at times. And the one different thing about Hinduism compared to other religions, especially religions whose roots aren't in Hinduism, uh, you'll find that things are a lot more like guidelines and philosophies rather than clear black and white rules. Okay, and this is because Hinduism, without any religion... What, uh... Okay, and for those of you who are embarking on this journey to understand Hinduism, but you are not a Hindu yourself, and again, like I said, it might be just because you're curious, you might be because you're ser seriously looking for some answers, just widening your horizons, your perspective. It's all good. Uh, you're all welcome. Um, just a heads up for you as well, that sometimes what you might find is going to be quite strange and mind-bending compared to what you might be used to, and also a lot of the things in Hinduism might feel more like guidelines rather than clear black and white rules. And this is because Hinduism, uh, without any exaggeration, is probably best described as a philosophy or a way of life, and many Hindus do actually amongst ourselves, we, we, we kind of identify it more as a philosophy or a way of life rather than a religion, even though we know, like, from external perspective, if someone asks us, we would say it's a religion, but we sometimes, often, amongst ourselves, we just say it's like a way of life, it's philosophy more than anything else. So, uh, Hinduism is not, any, uh, you know, dogmatic in any sense of the word, and as you read through it and familiarize yourself with it, you might find that it's got quite a different vibe and um, compared to other belief systems, whether it be religious or otherwise, I should add. Even non-religious belief systems can be quite um, sort of black and white. And in Hinduism's case, it's not like that. Everything is very flexible. It's very fluid. It's very perspective based. Everything is up for discussion and so on. So to give you a couple of examples and obvious examples and differences um, compared to other religions or belief systems, for example, in Hinduism, there is no central authority. Okay, there's no central authority, anything like that. Also, to, as it appears to me, there is no real origin story of the religion itself. Uh, I think it's mainly because of how old it is, right? When you're talking about 10,000, 15,000 years, this is a very long time ago. Uh, than maybe 500, 1,000, 2,000, 2,500 sorts of years ago. Um, another thing would be there is all nothing at all, nothing at all stopping anyone from becoming an expert in Hinduism through intense, sincere study and effort. It's not like if you're not this, you can't be it. You know, it's nothing stopping you. Nothing. It's not like this person has a right and you don't have a right. It's not really, that doesn't exist in any form as well. Um Hinduism also has no interest in converting anyone uh, anyone else to its way of life, really. So conversion is not a thing. If you want to convert to Hinduism, of course, of your own choice and your own accord, it's all good, you know, it's all welcoming. And uh, there's no even real conversion ceremony, okay? People have created uh, conversion ceremony over time because people wanted to convert to Hinduism and they were like, okay, how do I do this? So they came up with a ceremony. But in reality, there's no such thing as converting to Hinduism. I mean, strictly speaking, even if you, you know, read religious studies, textbooks or anything like that, you know, GCSEA level, they'll mention that Hinduism is not something you convert to. It's more like Hinduism is just, a Hindu is born, basically. You can't be, you can't convert to Hinduism, you're born a Hindu. But nonetheless, there is also no such thing as you not becoming a Hindu if you want to by 
following all the philosophies and principles and stuff like that. It's not the case, oh, you weren't born a Hindu, so you can't be a Hindu now. That that also isn't a thing. And at the same time, though, there is also no, strictly speaking, there's no conversion ceremony. So uh, just explaining to you a couple of things which you might find different already and giving you a heads up on these sorts of things compared to other assumptions uh, you may already have about the religion or some other religion or belief systems you might be familiar with. And these things might be quite different. And again, you can be a Hindu, you can be a spiritual Hindu, agnostic Hindu, atheist Hindu, just a philosophical Hindu. Uh, you know, all of these things are perfectly okay. And when I say some of these things, even other Hindus find it quite surprising, but, but it is true. There will also be differences in opinions within Hinduism. So, for example, you may see somewhere where it says God is uh, formless and infinite and shapeless and things like that. And so you should worship God in that supreme formless state. Um, and it will, at the same time, not prohibit idol worship. Okay, so um, that... Uh, the idol worshipping, for example, you could say that, well, the idol's source of the idol, one way or the other, is the supreme. So by um, worshipping the idol, you are kind of uh, separated from the supreme, but it, because it's, it's in a form, but you can still worship that with a, a goal being to reach the supreme being, for example. So both is okay. Okay, the formless worship is okay, and idol worship is also okay. That's fine. So here again, I would say, at least in my understanding, there appears to be no wrong way to reach the Supreme Being, okay? No, there is no wrong way to realize the ultimate truth, whatever that may be, assuming that exists. So there are many thousands, probably, of other differences between Hinduism and other religions, uh, which makes it quite a different sort of subject, at least as an insider looking out. Of course, your views may differ on this. Uh, but in the last few sentences, I've just tried to attempt to provide you with a light touch to expect something different uh, when compared to other religions which you may be more familiar with or which seem familiar to your instinctive beliefs, for example. So, um, yeah, so again, to summarize, if you are already a Hindu, um, then you might be familiar with some aspects of this. But if you're not a Hindu, the most important thing would be to go in with an open and flexible mind, know that things are designed to be flexible and there are guidelines rather than absolute black and white lines. Um, and my view on this is that at some point uh, in the past, many thousands of years ago in Hinduism, I'm sure things were black and white, but after thousands of years of civilization, um, I think there's been probably realizations along the way, adaptations, uh, that strict rules probably didn't work the way they should have in all the circumstances, but a philosophical approach uh, did work over you know many, many thousands of years um, uh, to help uh, humans in their life. Okay? Having said that, if you do desire an absolute black and white rule book on Hinduism, uh, I am sure that there will be a set of Hindu beliefs which already exists in some sect of Hinduism that you are free to follow just try to Google it and you'll find something. But either way, uh, worry not, because by following this guide, which I'll provide you in this episode, you should be well on your way uh, to your spiritual journey and find the answers that you are so looking for. Um, I should also take a moment to describe the sort of person that the method uh, outlined in this guide might be suitable for, because we all learn in different ways. Some people can learn just from reading, others are visual learners, Others may need to have a verbal discussion, maybe draw diagrams, go through presentations, or be in an interactive classroom environment. And um, I must say that with this episode and the focus being on a self-help guide, it does involve a lot of reading. Okay, So it will inadvertently mean that those who find it easiest uh, to follow the method provided for the self-help are those who find it easiest to learn things through self-reading. Okay, now that could be considered a limitation of the self-help self -help guide, but the context in which I've made this episode is for someone who wants to know about these things but finds themselves in a position where they don't know anyone else who can support them. There's, there's no opportunities for you to meet someone else, speak with someone else, etc., uh, to seek the guidance that you need, 
you have to rely on yourself and the only way I can imagine is by reading through the stuff just like I did because that's the position I kind of found myself in uh, all those years ago when I was trying to figure all of this out. So some further guidance would be that um, if after attempting this self-help guide and after covering 20% of the minimum reading material and you're finding that uh, it doesn't quite suit your learning style um, and that's okay. that's okay you know you're absolutely free to explore another method to learn about Hinduism rather than uh, the reading sort of self-reading self-learning kind of method which has been provided in this episode because something else might better suit your learning style um, having said that, I still want to help as many people as possible who are interested in this subject uh, in this episode and for such individuals who are not the biggest fan of just leading, uh, sorry, reading copious amounts of material, at the end of this video I will give you two separate ways to approach this problem and one will be like a two rule guide which you can follow, a two rule pathway and the second will be just a one rule. Okay, just one single rule that you have to follow for the rest of your life and that might still give you the answer that you're looking for. Uh, and if you do either of those, I'm quite confident that uh, you will live quite a satisfactory life. Okay, so uh, like I said, I'll give you the full self-reading, self-help guide sort of a method. Uh, if you take that approach, uh, you don't like it, you can seek some other approach. Um, if you still need some help, uh, of course, uh, at the end of this video, there will be a little bit of guidance, like I said, the two rules and then the one rule. And if you follow them, I think you might still be okay. Also, the sort of place you might find yourself in the people who are interested in this video are those on a spiritual journey of some sort, okay? They... Like I said, this girl that I spoke with, right, going through some difficult times and obviously the uh, not able to find the answers that they're looking for, which is why they're going back to the roots uh, of their religion, for example, or philosophical approach. So I think that the sorts of people who are most likely to want to uh, go on this journey are those who are looking for some sort of spiritual uh, journey, a spiritual answer. And I've tried to come up with a definition of spiritual or spirituality and what it means to me anyway. And I would describe it as a yearning for the human mind to unify uh, the emotional uh, with the rational, okay, because uh, these two are like water and oil, all right, they don't want to mix, uh, but they are both a core part of being a human being. So I think this is where sort of philosophy, religion, they come into the picture to act as an emulsifier in an, in an attempt to kind of mix the emotional with the rational so that the human mind feels better able to understand the world more intuitively a world which is obviously incredibly complex the one that we find ourselves living in where on many case, cases and many occasions uh, it seems that the world is anything but intuitive so i hope that uh, initial kind of introduction a few pointers um, a few heads ups um, maybe uh, the methods that we're going to use and the sort of person uh, that this might appeal to. I hope all of those words there kind of helped you just set the picture up a little bit about uh, the sort of person this video is uh, designed for, if you like. And having got that out of the way, we will now go on to the minimum reading material um, that you should go through in order to start and embark on your journey to understand Hinduism. Now, to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and I'll talk you through the various reading materials. Uh, again, just highlight a couple of bits here and there which you can go through. All right, so now we're going to go through the reading material that I recommend you go through. Okay, so uh, um, all of this reading material is going to be free. I'm also going to try and go through this as quickly as possible because I don't want to bore anyone else and it is just a reading, um, but I'll give you some guidance as well. So first of all, Whenever you read through all of this stuff, don't worry if you don't understand all the words because there's going to be English words next to them to describe to you what it means. So here, for example, you don't need to know what yagna means. You just need to know that there is such a thing as sacrificial rites. You may not remember the word bhakti, but you know devotion. You may be familiar with that. Okay, similarly, you don't need to read the Devanagari script. It says here, Sanatan Dharma. You don't need to be able to read Sanatan Dharma or know what it means as long as you know that the literal translation is the eternal dharma 
that's what Hinduism is actually called uh, by itself. Okay, uh, it's called uh, Sanatana Dharma. So this is the first article you're going to read, Wikipedia, and you're going to read through this whole thing. Now, certain sections are going to be historical. Certain things are going to be talked about in terms of Swami Vivekananda here. It says, you know, key figure. It doesn't matter. You don't, you don't need to know all these things at all. You're just trying to understand what Hinduism is, okay? You don't need to understand necessarily the geographical spread of Hinduism or everything else like that. It's up to you. If you want to read into that more, you can. But otherwise, you want to kind of read more crucial things like this. So as here it says authority. So you probably do want to kind of have an understanding of how this part works or ritual okay or sadhana or life cycle rites of passage you want to have a good idea and understanding of what these concepts actually mean it's quite a long article i appreciate that but you're going to read through it you're going to understand it as much as possible don't worry about understanding it to a level where you can pass an exam on it we're not concerned with that as, at this stage you're a beginner but you are just going to understand it as much as possible uh, to help you on your journey so First article to read, Hinduism on Wikipedia. You can understand it as much as possible. Don't put too much pressure on yourself for knowing all the different words or timelines. and Don't worry about that. Just get a good, decent understanding as much as you can on Hinduism. Once you've done that, you're going to read the next Wikipedia article, which is Mahabharat. Okay, it says right here, it is one of the two major Smriti texts and Sanskrit epics of ancient India revered in Hinduism, the other one being Ramayana. Okay, and it says uh, uh, provides further context as well. This is the second article you are going to read. Again, in full, as much as possible, trying to understand it as much as possible, etc. Um, I'll give you some other tips on how to sort of read through the Mahabharata as well once you get to it, but uh, I'll, I'll give you that a couple of articles later. So, uh, once you've read the Mahabharata, oh, I should also mention that you should read this in the order I'm telling you. Uh, personally, in my opinion, uh, don't read number four before you've read one, two, and three, for example. Don't go two, four, one, don't do that. So you do it in order I'm giving you. So you start with Hinduism. The next one you're going to read is Mahabharat. After that, you're going to read Ramayan. So here's the Ramayan article. You're going to read this on Wikipedia. You can see it's all free. You're not going to pay for anything uh, at all. This is the third article you're going to read. After reading these uh, three articles thus far, you're going to get your hands on a summary of the Mahabharata. Okay, I'm sure you'll be able to find one online. Okay, but that's what you're going to do. You're going to find a summary. And my suggestion to you is find the longest summary that you can tolerate reading through and remembering. If it's a three page summary, you, you download and you read a three page summary. If you can tolerate and read through a 10 page or 20 page or 50 page summary, then you download and read through a 50 page summary. The longest summary that you feel you can tolerate. Furthermore, you will also find Mahabharat books which are written for in a much simple form as well, which are usually designed for like uh, children really, 10 year olds, 11 year olds, things like that. But since you are a beginner on your journey, you may want to download or, or see or go to some online retailer and um, find a copy of those um, sort of simple summary books just to get, uh, get an idea. But ideally, like I said, you should challenge yourself with the longest summary that you feel you can go through in a reasonable amount of time. Remember, you have a lot of other reading to cover as well, so you don't want to get stuck on just one aspect, although that's no bad thing. Some people do just will will pick um, a text and just go with that as their main guidance for the rest of their life. But if you want to get a holistic view, then remember you have a lot of other reading to do as well. So the second article you're going to read is Mahabharata. Um, uh, apologies, the uh, summary that you're going to get is Mahabharata. The second book you're going to read after Mahabharata is a summary of Ramayana. Okay, so same approach, the longest summary that you feel you can tolerate in a language in which you can understand. And whenever you get access to these books, you want to make sure they are as close to the pure translations without any bias or anything else like that. And that should be a priority. Uh, you may find different versions of texts and different people trying to push different uh, sort of agendas or biases, you want to avoid that. You just want a literal, pure translation of things written um, and translated as close to how they were written as possible. So Ramayana is the next summary you're going to read. Once you've done that and you've got the summary readings under your belt for Mahabharata and Ramayana, you are going to now read another Wikipedia article and that is Advaita Vedanta. Okay, so this is a philosophical approach. 
Um, Advaita Vedanta sound, uh, stands for non-dualism, okay, ultimately, non-dual. So n uh, not one or the other, but both. That's the best way I can describe it or take a physics concept. It's a quantum state. It's not one or zero. It's not binary. It's one and zero and everything in between. And it's classically sort of uh, displayed as, as this picture right here where all of this is water. The droplet is water. The body of water is water. The waves on and the ripples on the surface are also water. Even though your mind distinctively identifies as these different parts, especially the waves. The waves is literally just the water. But you may identify or give a separate source of identity to the waves, separate source of identity to the droplet of water, etc. Okay, but ultimately it's all the same. Another metaphor I could give you is let's say visually um, you have glasses which just see energy. That's it. They don't see anything else, okay? They don't see in any other spectrum. They only see energy. In that case, you probably wouldn't see any distinction between anything that you see, right? Because whether it's the space-time fabric, whether it's the planets, whether it's anything that you can possibly imagine, it's all composed of energy ultimately. So if you actually viewed things in energy, you would see no distinction between anything, okay? So that's, that's another metaphor that I kind of came up with one time when I was trying to explain it to someone else that everything in the world is energy. Uh, if you could just see an energy and not anything else, then you would see no distinction between anything that you saw because everything is energy, okay? The distinctions that you see is is in the presence of the ignorance of the energy and you, you actually associate different forms and figures and stuff like that uh, to a uh, thing which is ultimately the same as energy, for example, whatever that may be and however mysterious that may be. So you've read Advaita Vedanta, brilliant congratulations well done you're making great progress okay and after you've done that you're going to read the Bhagavad Gita article okay right here Bhagavad Gita article you're going to read through this and uh, there's something I should mention to you at this point actually which is that when you read through all of these texts there's two ways you can look at it you can either say that uh, these were literally true and this literally happened, okay? So there was literally a horse and a carriage at that point in time, and it was covered in gold and this, that, and the other, and there were these sorts of weapons and supernatural weapons which existed and X, Y, Z, and A, B, C. You could take it literally that it did exist, or alternatively, you can take a metaphor or like a simile kind of approach and say that these things are concepts and these things are tales which are there to make you understand a larger, more meaningful lesson uh, which has served the test of time and helped millions of humans over the thousands of years. So, give you an example. Uh, s taking something as literally true, I mean, that's straightforward. Okay, here you go, we have this image, and you can say this is exactly how these things occurred. On the other hand, you can take a metaphorical approach, which we will try and do, so right here. So, I have said, Gita, metaphor, horses are the five senses. Okay, because that's another approach you can take. So, in that uh, school of thought, if you like, you'd say, well, the, another thing thing happened because, you know, we can't find any archaeological evidence and uh, the technology wasn't this advanced back in the days when this was actually written or the times that, that this, the, these things are describing. So you could say, well, in that case, you know, maybe the five horses are the five senses, you know, they, they represent tasting, sense, uh, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling and touching. And the chariot's reins, which the chariot uses to drive his vehicle, symbolizes the human mind. And the driver represents the human intelligence, whilst the passenger represents or symbolizes the person's spirit or the person's soul. And similarly, you can see kind of a uh, kind of description here, which I'm highlighting on the screen right now. So you can also take an approach somewhere in between. You could say that these things and this war and this uh, that really did happen all those all those years ago. But it wasn't that it was with chariots and stuff like that. Maybe it was just fought with sticks and stones and it wasn't like a million people fighting in the war. It was maybe one village of 3,000 and another village of 3,000. But back in those days, 3,000 was a lot of people. Uh, you know, so, uh, but nonetheless, over the years, these stories have been embellished upon uh, because they're so significant and so that they're still remaining impressive to this day because contained within these stories are very, very valuable and timeless lessons which humanity will benefit from. And therefore, that in that approach, you could say, uh, you, I'm taking both approaches, right? I'm saying it did happen, but not in the way exactly as it's being described. And number two, um, the reason it's still being preserved and talked about today is because there are some contained within it, very sophisticated 
uh, and very advanced thoughts and philos uh, philosophies which can be applied not just today but even for the next thousand years just as it has been applied for the last 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 or however long it might have been. So those are the two approaches you can take. So uh, so now you have uh, read through by now the Bhagavad Gita, okay, uh, the article anyway. And after you've read the Bhagavad Gita article, oh, by the way, you can see here, so a lot of physicists have been in inspired by Hinduism and, and texts and such as well. So, uh, and that's true, especially for like quantum physics and things where things get very weird. Um, so it's interesting uh, here. Okay, so to give you another taster of why over time so many physicists and mathematicians and so on have been inspired by Hinduism, uh, I would encourage you to read about this particular story in Hindu mytholo uh, mythology, uh, which describes the story of King um, Raivat Kakudmi, who travels to meet uh, Brahma in his world. Okay, so Brahma lives in uh, Brahmalok. And now Brahma's time is different to our time, okay? Um, it's it's eons difference. So um, between Brahma waking up and going to bed uh, and then going to sleep, uh, and his one day is the equivalent of something like the entire cosmos coming into existence and disappearing from existence. So you can imagine the relativistic time difference that occurs uh, between uh, one Brahma's day and uh, one of our days, okay? One of our days is like an something nanosecond or something like that. So if you were to visit from Earth uh, and you were go to going to Brahmalok, okay, by the time you'd come back, a lot of time would have passed. And that relativistic time, uh, I believe the earliest description of that sort of time being a relative place and you're going from a place which where the time is, uh, is a lot uh, faster compared to you going to somewhere else where time is a lot slower and what the impact would be by the time you get back uh, this story right here is one of the first ones, I believe, the oldest one, which experience, uh, which explains that in a very clear way. So I would encourage you to read about this particular story if you want to find out as to why over the years so many mathematicians and physicists have been inspired uh, by Hinduism. It's because of things like this, and it's probably the only kind of religion that really talks about these sorts of concepts. But anyway, we don't want to digress, and we are going to carry on uh, with the rest of where we were. Okay, so now that you've read the Bhagavad Gita, uh, article, you're going to actually read the Bhagavad Gita itself. And the best um, version of Bhagavad Gita, in my opinion, in terms of translation, is uh, a website which is bhagavad-gita.org. Okay, bhagavad-gita.org. And we're going to go to that now. So you can see I've got it right here, opened up. Okay, this is the main page. And again, you don't need to read all of this. You don't need to even see these videos or read all of this um, but you can see that so many other influential people you've got Albert Einstein for example who've all kind of mentioned or been inspired from and, and things like that when it comes to Hinduism Hindu concepts of Bhagavad Gita etc uh, so how it's revered across different cultures and religions as well but uh, like I said don't need to read all this but here are the main things. You've got chapter 1, 2, 3, 5, 6. So you've got 18 chapters. And once you click on this, each of these chapters ha will show, th uh, show the verses. It'll show the translation. So it'll show the initial Sanskrit version and how each word has been translated. So it gives you a very clear way right here. It gives you a very clear way to validate whether what's being said here is true or false. The second thing as well, uh, what it does here is you can see that it doesn't, it's not trying to force any version on you okay it's not trying to force any particular version of events this is what it says in sanskrit this is what it says in sanskrit okay but just in uh, the english language written down and then if i zoom in this is what it says what what every single word means okay and i've actually validated this to an extent so so yeah this is all you know you can you, you can use a sanskrit dictionary you can validate that all these english words are translated from these sanskrit words and you can see the Sanskrit version here. You can then check the independent Sanskrit version as well. But anyway, and then you can see the translation here, right? So this is one example of translation. On the right-hand side, you can even see the translation in various different languages. So you can see Hindi, you can see Dutch, German, Chinese, Hebrew, Arabic, Russian, uh, Italian, you know, you, all these languages. Some people have kindly uh, translated uh, the things in these languages too, so other people can understand. 
On the left hand side, which you can't quite see, it's outside the screen here in the recording, but you can see the shortcut to the various different chapters as well. If you are then struggling to understand what it means after having read this, don't worry, it's fine. You can have uh, four different perspectives from four different people uh, as to what they think it means at the bottom. I, I, I don't read this, okay, but if you want to, if you need help, this doesn't quite make sense in the context, you can read this. So this is a really good website resource, I think, is bhagavad-gita.org. I think it's an excellent source, and this, in my opinion, sh is, is what should be your source of reading through the Bhagavad Gita, you know, one page at a time. Uh, the other alternative you have, which is slightly um, not as pure, I would say, in my opinion, but it's the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Okay, you can also download that one or go to the website. It's called Bhagavad Gita as it is, which is part of the ISKCON uh, foundation or group or whatever it's called. Uh, but that's another version of the Bhagavad Gita, which you might want to read. So here you go. This is what you're going to read. And that's your resource. I know what you're thinking. How much more reading do you have to do? There is a lot of reading. Like I said, it's a big subject. Okay, so if you want to understand this, these are the things you're going to have to go through now. By all means, if you feel that by now you've already discovered the answer you needed, fine, you can stop here. But personally, I would encourage you to keep going. And the next thing you're going to read uh, is an article, which is this one. Yoga Vashishta. Okay, this is what you're going to read. Yoga Vashishta, uh, Samhitai says here, Yoga Vashishta uh, Ramayan, it's what it says here, right? So you want to read this particular article. Once you have read this article, you are actually going to read the book, Yoga Vashishta Maharamayan. And in terms of how you get that book, you have this website right here. What I'm also going to do is I'm going to share you a Google Drive link from where you can download these books and the resources uh, later on if you want to go through that. But you can see here in this section right here, okay, it tells you that the book is available for free, completely free, uh, in EPUB as well as Mobi format. And this is a book you're going to read. This is a big book, guys. Okay, it's quite a lot of pages. It's a lot of reading, but you are going to love and enjoy this reading, I assure you. This is one of my favorite, if not the most favorite pieces of literature I have ever read. And that includes Shakespeare. It includes everything. In fact, once you read through this book, um, you may even conclude that uh, Shakespeare is not all that, okay? And that's saying something. And there are like probably another 10, pay, 10 books like this in Hindu scriptures, but I've only read this one. So this is the next book you're going to read. This one, I believe it's one of the most important books that you can read on Hinduism. And it will cover all the other concepts of Hinduism you've read so far, as well as introduce you to new Hinduism concepts. Okay, so just to recap, because I know we've gone through a lot, you're going to read the Hinduism article, then the Mahabharata article, then Ramayan, then you're going to read and obtain your own copy of the summary of Mahabharata and a summary of Ramayan, the longest summary you can tolerate and read through. After that, you're going to read the Advaita Vedanta Wikipedia article, you're then you're going to read the Bhagavad Gita Wikipedia article. Then you're going to read the Bhagavad Gita itself from this website, which I showed you. Uh, again, I will show you the Google Drive link so you have all the resources in one place. After you've done that and understood that, you're going to read Yoga Vashishta article. And once you've done the Yoga Vashishta article, you're going to read the Yoga Vashishta book itself, which you can download from here. But again, I will share with you uh, the Google Drive link, which has these files. They're completely free. And I'm 99.99% sure that all of these people, they don't mind you sharing these books with your friends and so on, so long as you're not charging anything for them and you're not publishing them for money, uh, which obviously I have no intention to do. I'm just sharing it with my viewers so that they too can uh, be on their spiritual journey. So you've read now the Yoga Vashishta. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, if you absorb all the information that is in this book, it will change your life, okay? And it'll change your life for the better, so long as it suits you. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita book itself, sorry, apologies, the Yoga Vashishta Maharamayan book itself might even say that it may not be suitable for everyone, this book, okay? So if you read 
20% of this, 30% of this, you think this does, doesn't agree with me, it doesn't make sense to me, I don't want to read it anymore. You don't have to, okay? But I would suggest that you read the entire thing. So assuming that you've read the entire thing, and by now remember, you're not just reading, I think it'll probably be inevitable, but you want to start applying a lot of the concepts and things you've read thus far into your life. And you have been doing that day to day as well. You have to use these things and concepts and you have to test them. Remember, you have to question it to see if it actually makes sense. That's part of being a Hindu as well. You don't just follow it and then do what it says without really thinking about it yourself. You have to think about it. You have to contemplate on it and you have to see what works, what doesn't work and sort of um, explore the subject. So I'm assuming you've been doing all that as well. And I would congratulate you because you've made so much progress so far as well. And now we come to the final book that you have to read, okay? And the final article you're going to read is the Ashtavakra Gita. Ashtavakra Gita, okay? You're going to read this article. Fortunately, this is nowhere near as long as the other articles you might have read thus far, okay? It is probably not even as popular in the sense that many people may not even know about this book, even Hinduisms. Uh, sorry, even Hindus, I should say. But yeah, you should you should read this article. Very short. And after you've read this article, you're going to read the Ashtavakra Gita itself. Now, when we're approaching the Ashtavakra Gita, the best way I could describe it is to, uh, to begin with, you are um, exploring texts and concepts in its full elaboration, sort of long form and uh, versions. Uh, long form versions and as you're approaching Ashtava Krikita you are coming down to approaching the E equals MC squared size, uh, side of the equation if you like okay before you get to the E equals MC squared there's a lot of mathematical proof and a lot of physics to get your head around before you understand what E equals MC squared even is or you approach that but E equals MC squared is very small. It's very summarized. Okay, it's 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 even a child can write down E equals MC squared. It's so so easy. But behind that summary is a lot of a lot of complex, a lifelong worth of uh, physics to learn, uh, if you like. Okay, to really understand uh, E equals MC squared. So this is kind of similar thing happening here. You've read a lot of stuff in long form, and that's all been crucial to developing the foundation that you now have. And we're now approaching like a summary of it all, and it's getting really minimalist and simplified, and it's getting really conceptual now. Uh, it's getting really, really to the upper tiers of intellectualism, uh, if that's a word, okay? So you're going to read Ashtavakra Gita at the end. How are you going to get your hands on the Ashtavakra Gita? So here is a sanskritdocuments.org is a website. Uh, I'm referring you to here just because I think it's a good resource. But this is the place from which I was able to obtain a long time ago uh, a copy of the Ashtavakra Gita um, text. So here is the text itself. So this is Ashtavakra Gita translated by John Richards. John Richards is the person who translated it. And you can see the translation here. Okay. And you can see at the bottom this email address, sanskrit at cheerful.com. And that is linked to this particular website right here, which is sanskritdocuments.org. Okay, so that's where you got the translation from. Now remember, I'm going to share with you the um, Google Drive link for all the resources that I've uh, discussed with you. So you should be able to access the websites I've mentioned, as well as download the ebooks and PDF formats and so forth. So there's even an easier version or easier to read version than this one, which is e-reader friendly, which I've also uploaded on that same folder, which you can access. Once you have read the Ashtavakra Gita, you have ended this course, which I have provided for you, the self-study, the self-help course uh, on understanding Hinduism. Okay. Uh, and you have completed your journey as a beginner, beginner slash intermediate by now. And you should probably consider yourself, in my opinion, so long as you've read all this, you've understood uh, most of it, I should say maybe 60 to 80% of it, most certainly the concepts, I would say you're now approaching beginner to kind of intermediate level. To take it even further, you should be applying all of these concepts throughout your life on a day-to-day -day basis. They should, these things should kind of be the framework which you use to kind of live your life um, 
And remember, that still means taking a scientific, a rational approach. You know, these are not averse. These things are not contradictory. It's not like you're a neurosurgeon, but you can't follow these things. Like I said, these things you should take as a philosophical approach to life and see how you can improve the problems that life uh, brings to you. So there ends the guide and the minimum reading material for those who wish to embark on this journey. And I wish you well and all the best and the good luck. And I hope that you find what you're looking for. Now, I did also mention earlier on in this episode that for this method may not be suitable for everyone because it heavily relies on reading, heavily relies on self-reflection and self-study and so on. And it can be quite long, quite convoluted, perhaps quite tedious. And uh, for those of you, you might be looking for something simpler. So for those of you, I would like to suggest to you a couple of rules for you to follow. They're very simple. You should be able to uh, fit in with your existing life and existing set of beliefs. They're very kind of vanilla. They're very safe. I don't think there's much risk in them either. Um, and they're as follows. So th there's going to be two methodologies that I give you, one with two rules and one with one rule. Uh, so the first one, uh, we can call it, let's say we call it unity, okay, unity pathway. So there's only two rules with this one. The first rule is be nice to yourself and to others. Okay, and the second rule is never ruin your own or anyone else's day. That's it. There's only two rules, okay, and you must follow them no matter what, with full faith, unquestionably. Um, you must live your life by these two rules. Again, I'll, I'll give you those again. Be nice to yourself and to others and never ruin your own or anyone else's day. And I think that if you follow those uh, to their utmost limit, uh, it should set you up uh, to head into the right direction um, and provide you with the spiritual answers that you're looking for. Um, and you should get some sort of fruit at the end of it all, I believe anyway. But uh, that's for you to test. Um, now, some other people might say, you know what, that's also a bit too complicated for me. Those are still two rules. I just need the one thing, the one thing I do, which is going to work. And this, from all the reading I did about Hinduism, if there was one rule I could come up with, um, which kind of is, is said to solve solve all the problems that you have, it's as follows. Only one rule, okay? And which is this. It is destroy all your desires. That's it. If there's one single rule or one single set, uh, one single instruction that you need, which I can extract from all the reading I've done, uh, it would be destroy all your desires. If you are desireless, then you are free because this whole world only appears to you due to your desires. And once your desires cease to exist, so does the persistence of this world illusion or Maya. Okay, so you may do with that as you may. I'm not entirely sure how you can approach doing that. Uh, sometimes the task seems impossible, but uh, that that is the one single silver bullet, if you like, which is destroy all your desires. If you can do that, uh, apparently you you can see what the the ultimate truth is and. Uh, you experience you know, heaven whilst you're living and all sorts of things, if you believe in such things. So thanks very much for listening to this episode. I hope it helps someone out there. Um, I really appreciate the time you spent listening to this one. If you did, um, please like, comment, subscribe to the channel, have a discussion in the comment section, uh, share your views, share your thoughts. Maybe someone else will also share theirs in response. Uh, but I thank you very much and I will see you in the next one. Thank you. Goodbye.